And this one is telling us how he discovered in the very first part. He says this has happening at the time when he was still a bodhisattva, not fully enlightened. So we know that he wasn't awake yet. And he says, alas, the world has fallen into trouble in that it is born, it ages and dies. It passes away and is reborn, yet it does not understand the escape from the suffering that is headed by this aging and death. And when now will an escape be discerned from this suffering that is headed by aging and death? When will it happen? Hmm. And then it occurred to me, when this, when what exists, does the aging and death come to be? He starts to ask a question. And this is what I want you to do this week. I want you to ask the question, you know, what exists does aging and death come to be? By what is aging and death conditioned? Then bhikkhus through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. And when there is a birth, aging and death, it comes to be. Aging and death has birth as its condition. So it can't exist unless we're born. It can't happen. This aging process and death, it just can't. So this is the beginning of what his search is. And then later on, he starts teaching about this. And we look at a couple different places and see what it says about aging and death. And when he's talking about it, initially, probably in the beginning, he's looking at the whole cycle okay, of this thing, but he's also looking, I believe, at the smaller circles and cycles that we're going to look at. And these are the cycles, these smaller cycles, that have to do with the phenomenological examination of dependent origination. Now, first of all, what is dependent origination? It's dependent, the origination is something depending on something else, which is not part of this but has to exist before this can come up. Say that again. Okay, so the, the dependent origination is when something originates, but it depends on something else has to be there first for it to happen. But then this is not part of that. It is not part of it. And this was cleared up in Karuna Dasa's Foundation of Buddhism book. He did a really good job of clearly explaining that you know, that he said, you have to look at this. People usually look as if they're all involved in each other by the time they go up the ladder, but they're not exactly involved with each other. And he looked very carefully and he says, look, when this happens, then this happens. But this doesn't become part of this. So what's the best example of this? Go to a staircase, okay? go to the bottom of the staircase in the cellar or something somewhere and go up the stairs one step at a time. Don't have to go to the cellar. Any staircase will do. But when you go up the staircase next time, you watch. The second step cannot exist without the first step being there, right? But when you step on the second step, is any part of the first step in the second step? No. And when that one exists, the third and the fourth and the fifth. You see that? And you get a feel. I don't know if he was doing that at the university where he was when he wrote that book. He was in Hong Kong. I don't know, but um, I didn't ask him. But I thought that was really an earth-shattering thing for me. I didn't see that until I went to visit him in Sri Lanka. He's retired and he's an, an emeritus that lives in um, Sri Lanka. But it was very interesting to listen to him talk about it and, and how he, he sat there and said this and I'm there. That's pretty simple to understand. But they are the, the, um, the condition necessary for the next one to exist. But then they're not part of it anymore. So you can look at them individually. So aging and death. Okay. The aging and death section I'm looking at is in Sutta number nine on page 135. So we start with this in section 20, the aging and death, saying, good friend, a bhikkhu delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. And then they asked him a further question. And, but friend, 
Might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one in right view and has arrived at this Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands aging and death, the origin of aging and death, the cessation of aging and death, and the way leading to the cessation of aging and death. In that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at the true Dhamma. Mm -hmm. So when he goes on to describe this, but when you are looking at aging and death, you're going to examine it according to what? According to the Four Noble Truths. You're going to use them now as a stepping stone. Now, this is interesting because if we haven't talked to this about this before, I want you to understand that everything, group of anything that we do imagine, or we, we don't imagine, but we examine, we observe if we take that, whatever part it is, and we examine it by the Four Noble Truths, that's the way we get deeper, 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 deeper into it. See? We get the deepest understanding by looking at it and then looking at its relationship to suffering, looking at how that came up, how it worked, and then what is the cessation of that happening and then we see we go over to path and path literally clears everything up when we start looking at a full path more closely okay now this goes on to say what is aging and death what is the origin of aging and death what is the cessation of aging and death so there you have the investigation what is the way leading to the cessation of aging and death now when they describe it here, they're going to explain it just in one size in relationship to this, the, the body that you have. That's what they're going to do in, the, in most of the descriptions. The aging of beings in the various orders of beings, their old age, brokenness, their teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, Decline of life, weakening of faculties is called the aging. The passing of beings out of the various orders of beings, they're passing away. The dissolution, disappearance, dying, and completion of time. The dissolution of the aggregates, okay, of the, of the five aggregates. Laying down of the body, this is called death. A body is looked upon as a shell, as a vehicle through the life. So the aging and the death are what is called aging and death. This is what it is. And with the arising of birth, there is the arising of aging and death. With the cessation of birth, there is the cessation of aging and death. I don't want you to just jump on that and say, well, I read the suttas. <laughs> And the cause of death is birth. So I'm just going to check out now because I don't want to go through this anymore. Don't do that until you find out the whole story. Okay. You know, you don't do that. Don't jump on something and say, well, the monk said I, I should never cut anything or any living piece of living green thing. So the man decided not to cut his grass anymore or clean up in front of his condo and to just leave everything to just grow over. It didn't go well. <laughs> didn't go well with the neighbors. Didn't go well with the neighborhood rules. Didn't work out. So he's not a monk. He didn't have to do that, but he, he jumped overboard. See, I don't want you to do that. The way leading to the cessation of aging and death is just the noble eightfold path. And then it goes into the whole entire thing of, of learning how to understand it, which if you looked at the whole eightfold path, you would see, you know, you need to have a harmonious perspective, an impersonal perspective, okay? You need to have harmonious images in your mind, right thoughts, pure thoughts as much as possible, right? You have to have a harmonious communication, way of communication. Communication is not just talking. No, my dog knows if I put my hand on my hip, 
he needed to go over by the door and get ready to go out. <laughs> You know, even the children, they knew when they were growing up, I put my hand on my hip and I just pulled my glasses down like that. You better come in because I called you twice. You better come in. <laughs> See what I'm saying? You don't have to say a word. It doesn't have to be just this speaking. Verbal thoughts and communication and all that inside, but the whole body position. You go on the internet, you look at the language of the positions of the body. Find a book on the language of the body language, positions of the body, and tell me that you are not talking. I know Princess Diana, she got anything she wanted by doing one thing. Go look at her pictures. She did this and she, in one of the body books. She just looked down, she looked up at you like this and tipped her head. She, tip her eyes up like this and show the whites and, and then she got anything she wanted. You see, it's, it's used as an example in many body language books. You see the pictures of her as a little girl. She was taught to do this or she just did it naturally. She could get anything she wanted, see? But she didn't have to say a word. So it's not just, just language, it's more than that, okay? So then after communication, you have movement of mind's attention. Now, this is a higher way, or you can say a higher level of looking at the Eightfold Path. The way we put it together, we go and look at it. We're looking at it in the direct way that has a relationship to your practice, to your development of your meditation. That's the way we teach everything. You can listen to Bonte's talks. It's all set up like that. We're mostly concerned what works for you, what doesn't work for you when you're meditating. You see? So we're speaking to you. Always think in terms of that when you listen to me or you listen to, to Bonte or even listen to Delson. It's coming out the same way, you know? So you listen because we're trying to show you how to make the meditation work. And it isn't just sitting longer. That's not it. You know, I met a woman once, this was way back in 2000, when I first started in Buddhism, she was out standing outside on the sidewalk in front of the Buddhist temple, Buddhist uh, Bihara, Washington Buddhist Bihara, and was considered one of the best sitters in Washington, DC. Someone told me that. I looked out the window a few minutes later and she was having an argument with somebody on the sidewalk. <laughs> and I, I thought it hit me so abruptly. I thought, oh, whoa, what is this? And I turned around, went back in, had tea with Bhante. He was at the temple. I said, you know, if this is where we're going, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to that place. I thought we were going somewhere else. And at that time, I didn't know much, but I really sensed we were going somewhere else. You're not going for two, three, four hours of sitting and the knowing of nothing of how things are working and nothing about this teaching. So the part of the biggest thing that makes this a wonderful experience with Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation is the, is the realization that when we show you this, we teach you in a parallel teaching. And we're doing it because the Buddha measured the modes of progress on his own monks by the nature of their meditation and the whether they had comprehension of the Dhamma. That's why. And we saw what was happening when we went in that direction, when he went in that direction, and he always has gone in that direction, Bhante. So when, you know, when you go in that direction with a student, wow, what can happen if they actually listen to you? In my case, and they all speak English, they're well-educated like this last retreat that I did. And um, they are 28, 30 years old, professionals, perfect English from all over different places in India. And they're sitting there to learn this. And they took notes and everything I suggested, everything that I, I told them to do, they wrote it down and they went to their rooms and they did it. And in a, just 10 days, they increased their sitting times. I just looked again yesterday to see if I was crazy from 25 to 30 minutes to three and four hours in 10 days. 
But that's not the impressive part. The impressive part was them coming in each day for an interview and explaining back to me what they learned and what they tried and what happened, you see, in the past 24 hours. That was where I really feel, yes, I know the subject. I am teaching you the right way. Because of what happened for these women was nothing short of like almost, a, you could say it's like a miracle for 10 days for what happened. But the secret partially was they had not been subjected or take intake of other types of meditation and other types of instruction. They were coming in a very pure way where they had no other meditation except some simple Christian prayer, you know, saying a prayer and sitting quietly. And that was it. They had no other experience with Buddhism. Our lessons in Buddhism were like a half hour each day learning about what Buddhism was and wasn't. So, so in, in teaching them this, this, these were Catholic nuns. And they were, it was easy for them to learn the inner relationship of how this this process, this, um, what he discovered can help them, can help anybody in humanity to become quiet, become calm, and bring your energy up, and be a candle, and shine. And then you tell me, how much does a candle do to light up a room? If you took your candle and put it on the saucer and you lit it and turned out the lights and then you turned around, had somebody light it, then you turned around and you sat down. What did the candle do actively to light that room? And that's about how much you're supposed to do actively in a meditation. That's about it. You shine like a little kid shining in, you know, first grade in, in, so excited about shining for everybody and being happy. Yeah. And you do that, you're going to spread this all around. And it the it's the frequency of it, as we know from, from Harvard and from MIT. So here we go. The uh, description of this is the passing away, dilution, disappearance, the dying, the completion of time, the dilution of the aggregates, laying down the body. That's called death. And so the aging and death are what is called aging and death. And this is the death. This death is called uh, the aging and death. And the cessation of birth, there is a cessation of aging and death. And the way leading to the cessation of aging and death is just the Noble Eightfold Path. And we went as far as the images, and then we went to the movement of mind's attention is... Um, this is something that if you're watching the movement of your mind's attention, you are actually cleaning up your action in life. So they used to call this right action, meaning right things you do, but mind is the forerunner of all states. And before action comes intention, and then comes the thought, and then it moves into the action, you see? So if you're working on mind, which is one thing this practice does, it goes to the source, it goes to the control center, of everything, which is up here, okay? And so by doing that, you are you are cleaning up the whole thing and, and doing it by, Bhatti used to tell it to you this way when he talked about um, right action. He said, why do we call it harmonious movement of mind's attention? Think about it this way. When you leave the house and you're walking to your bike or you're walking to a car, what is your mind doing while you're walking from the house to the car? What is your mind doing? And that happens first. So you're watching what your mind is doing all the time. You're paying attention to that is what you're doing. And that changes your action so that you can stay over in the wholesome realm of things. That's what you're doing, okay? And then uh, after that, Let's see. Then you have lifestyle. And the reason he says harmonious lifestyle, he does it one way, but actually I do it this way. I say lifestyle means my house, how I set up my house, whether it's as big as one room, like this sort of is, okay, or 
whether it's a whole house, I set up my living space so I have a private spot where I can have an altar and I can, even if there's a many Thai people put an altar in the corner of their room, you know, in the corner. And then in the corner, they put a little, um, you know, um, what do they call that? Jeez, oh, you know, a folding wall. <laughs> you know, a, a little room divider. You put that across that corner and then you just open it and go in there and say your prayers or, or do your recitation or chanting or anything you want to do. And that's your spot and your spot to meditate. Nobody bothers you if you're there. That's the way they handle it. And I think that's a very effective way of doing it in almost any sized living area, really. And then the, then the next one is um, your practice of... Um, your practice of right effort and right effort is uh, extraordinary we just we were just talking about right effort last night i uh, hope bonte's listening right now because this is interesting um you know we were just talking about right uh, effort met a monk that used this for his thesis to sort out right effort and right striving because i was talking to you about when uh, you know when you say right effort you're working on it and it starts to be going happening automatically I said to you, then it's right striving because they're actually the same paragraph. I've said that to you a few times, okay? And then uh, what um, I caught in a small booklet written by Ajahn Semedo and then another monk also um, was this idea that, um, let's see, that the, I have, um, let's see, right, that, yeah, okay. What you're trying to do is develop right striving. And in order to do that, you practice the right effort. And saying it that way make, is an interesting contemplation to consider it that way. So when you are attempting to develop right striving, you do that by practicing right effort. And right effort has these four steps, you see. And so that makes it so the two are, are the same thing also. We're, we're trying to figure out, now I have some people looking at it in the poly, they're gonna come back to me, that's gonna be fun. Okay, so when your practice is everything because your practice with the loss of right effort, with the loss of the four steps in right effort, um, you, can, you can go back and see the beginning of the collapse of the whole system, you see? Because when the attainments stop, then new instructions start happening in all directions. And many, 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 many variations happen. And there's an effort to keep the whole ship going, no matter what. And so this may be what has happened here. But we can't say when. But it really doesn't matter. But if you go, you just need to play the game that I played when I traveled around. And anytime you see a monk, just very innocently go up and say, sir, could you, Bonte, could you please explain to me what right effort is? And then just be quiet and listen. Don't contradict them, just listen. And after you do this 10, 20 times, you begin to wonder what happened to right effort? You know, it's where are the steps? But don't get in a conversation. Just, just listen, listen to what's happening. And it's, it's very much changed from what it was. And then there's another thing about when right effort is sitting there in, in this paragraph. There was one person that wrote, we do this one first, and then we practice the second part, and then we practice the third part, we practice the fourth. And what was that? Well, if you go back to Satipatthana, you see that 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 uh, this debate is there also, because if you examine body, feeling, mind, and dhammas, it cannot be practiced just as mind, just as body, just as feeling, and just as dhammas. And yet, that's what's trying to happen. So the results aren't the same. You can do it, but it doesn't gel. You see what I'm trying to say? It doesn't come together. And so in actuality, it's, the fr it's almost as frustrating to try to figure out how somebody could just go and practice feeling and nothing else. Think about that. How could they take those other things away, you know, and practice just feeling? You should test it for yourself and see how this is, is going. But 
they try to do that with the Satipatthana. So if Satipatthana was so important and everybody is going to read that sutta, definitely as if it's the only way to get to Nibbana, which I've heard these titles. And then the only, uh, the only way it was like the way and then the direct way. And then the only way is the most recent one, I think. Okay. Well, then it probably means that other things should be treated the same way is the way people would assume and they would try it and spend a long time trying it instead of being able to move right along the path. Anyway, okay. So the last two are the concentration um, and the, um, let's see, the collectedness and the concentration, the mindfulness and collect and, and concentration. And the mindfulness is turned into observation because that's what it really was observing. And when you go to 148 and you say, well, how come I can get to Nibbana, but he can't. When you look in 148 to the sections that we talk about in there, you begin to understand that it is impossible for the person to get there if they don't let go of lustful feelings and of the painful feelings and of the neutral feelings. And if they, if they cannot, um, if they uh, here and now make an end of suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling, without uh, abandoning uh, the, um, well, where is it? Let's see, without abandoning the underlying tendency for painful feeling and all these things, if you can't do that, you cannot reach Nibbana. But once you can let go of those, so there's this letting go process that happens. So there's all these steps. You see how it's all coming together? Okay, so the last one is the, the kind of concentration. And there are indicators. There are indicators, but the indicators are sitting in the text. So far, I haven't found them. I'm, I'm still looking to see what's actually in the Vasudhimaga and looking where, where were the, where are these pieces because it's so harsh, the way it treats everything in a very harsh, strong, oppressive kind of way, which once again, we go back to the candle and what did the candle do to light up the room? <laughs> the candle did nothing. So if we did nothing and we followed the instructions we hear, that's where we begin to reach and, and, and understand and have the ability to, to watch pure mind arise and understand what it is. Yeah. Okay. So when the noble disciple has thus understood this aging and death, the origin of aging and death, the cessation of aging and death, he here and now makes an end to all of his suffering. And in that way too, the noble disciple is one that becomes into right view because he has reached that state, okay? So then they go backwards and they talk about each one. If we go to 141, this is the other place we take a look. We go to 141 and 141, I always like looking at this because when I'm looking at, um, this section from section 12, you go to page 1098. Okay, it's in section 12. What it goes, what friends is the aging? It starts with the aging, then it does the death, then the sorrow, then the lamentation, then the pain, then the grief, and then the despair. And this is where you begin to see that he was very clear there were different kinds of uh, pain and. Uh, and different levels of suffering. And these are all described here. So he doesn't not tell you what these are. So if we listen, what friends is aging? The aging of beings in the various orders, their old age, brokenness of teeth and grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of life, weakness of faculties. This is called the aging. Now, in my, in my way of thinking, we could describe the um, <laughs> the reactions this way, and <laughs> they just disappear. They melt. The pictures of these reactions that we draw things from in the past, whoever it was, those images, they just fade away. 
and disappear like in a movie. They just fade away and they don't, they stop coming up because if you don't give them attention, those neural pathways that lead back to the past and all those things, all those different events across your life, you know, that you draw from to try to compare the present time with, that's your, that's the problem. That's what drives the reaction thing. And if you don't pay attention to them anymore, you're not feeding them. So what friends is death? It's the passing of this being out of or uh, various orders of beings, they're passing away, their dissolution, disappearance, dying, completion of time. Now see, completion of time and um, dissolution of aggregates laying down in the body, but completion of time, that does stand up to the completion of time where they had a lifetime where you were paying attention to them. And it's the completion of their time.